Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our event tonight with Navigate Skill and Grant Markets. Just before we get started, a few house rules. Authors, you are, um, that is Mary and Grail, you are both uh, welcome to take off your masks while you're speaking. Audience members, please keep your masks on at all times. And um, I would like to let you all know about a few events we've got going on at Green Apple in the coming days. Tune in to our next virtual event on Friday, November 5th, when Melissa Lozada Oliva discusses her new book, Dreaming of You, a novel in verse, with Hugh Min Yuen. And on Saturday, November 6th, we will be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Cohen Brothers classic movie, Fargo, as well as the release of A Lot Can Happen in the Middle of Nowhere, the untold story of the making of Fargo by Todd Melby. There will be a screening of the movie at the Roxy Theater and following that, a Q&A with the author. You can still get your tickets for that at greenapplebooks.com slash event. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our featured authors for this evening. Grill Marcus was born in San Francisco in 1945. He started writing for Rolling Stone in 1968 and currently writes for the Los Angeles Review of Books, where his column Real Life Rock Top 10 appears monthly. He is the author of Mystery Train, Lipstick Traces, Invisible Republic, aka The Old Weird America, Double Trouble, The Shape of Things to Come, The History of Rock and Roll in 10 Songs, and most recently, Under the Red, White, and Blue, Patriotism, Disenchantment, and the Southern Myth of the Great Gatsby. With Warner Solers, he is the editor of A New Literary History of America. He lives in Oakland. Mary Gateskill is the author of Bad Behavior, Two Girls, Fat and Thin, Because They Wanted To, Veronica, Don't Cry, The Mayor, Somebody with a Little Hammer, and This is Pleasure. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, Best American Short Stories, and The O. Henry Prize Stories. Her latest book, The Devil's Treasure, is the reason we're here this evening. Enjoy the show, everyone. Thank you for coming. How are we gonna? What are we gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different thing. This whole conversations idea. It's, it used to be like you would actually read, and then I guess people got tired of that, so we have to have a conversation. You want to start by reading something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> or if you don't want to, I. Will. No, I usually, I usually do. What were you gonna read though? I'll read something. This is uh, something really short. Um, it's uh, it's it happens towards the end of the book. The the book is connected by a a short story that's based on a dream that I had weirdly when I was six years old. Um, so this is just a little bit about that. At the date of this writing, I am sixty five years old. I dreamed of going to hell to steal from the devil when I was six. The story is not the same as the dream. In the dream, I didn't get lost in hell or meet anybody or see faces talking on a wall. I just took the treasure from behind the devil's armchair where he sat peacefully reading and ran back up the stairs into my yard, into my home. Right before I put the bag of treasure under my bed, I opened the top door of my dresser to see if my underwear and the weird little objects that I collected there were the same. That everything was as usual somehow convinced me that the dream was real, and I went to bed satisfied. I was very disappointed to find that the bag wasn't there the next day. I had another powerful dream sometime after that, maybe I was seven. I was at school in the big auditorium where we would be assembled for any important announcement or national occasion, like a speech about the meaning of Thanksgiving or patriotism. In the dream, the whole school was present and the principal was giving an inspiring speech. But we couldn't concentrate on the speech because behind the principal was this huge cake that was almost as high as the ceiling. 
When he was finished talking, we were going to eat the cake and he could hardly wait. He went on and on, but finally the moment arrived and all the kids charged the fantastic cake, which had been conveniently cut into individual pieces. I grabbed a piece and started to take a bite and then saw that the cake was full of worms. When I told my husband about this dream, he said, you are realizing at a young age that whenever an authority figure is giving an inspiring speech, you just know there's worms somewhere. <laughs> that could be. The social nature of the dream is clear in its location in the school assembly room, my locus of official civic life at the time. It is about socially dispensed bounty that is beautiful and appetizing, but full of rot, not visible from the outside. It's also about greed, the kind of greed that children are punished for in fairy tales, the forever greed of humankind. My dream of the devil was about greed too, for candy and the treasure with which to buy it. In the story about the dream, this greed comes from starvation. Women are starving for love and the beauty of a young man who lives in a delightful world, a young man whose own starvation transforms him into a house of horror where arms are torn off and eaten, a young man whose soul is a beautiful song trapped in the terrible place where it's housed. A rocky. Um, there are a whole lot of things that I want to ask you about, but one has to do with the story of emotional and two girls fat and thin. And it uh, has to do with a girl who comes into uh, the school of one of the characters, the, um, the, the thin closer to the microphone. Yeah, I'll try. Um, comes into the school of one of the characters, and she's fat, and she's always trying to make the best of everything. And everybody humiliates her, they bully her, um, they scorn her, and. Let's see, I'm 36. You'd say, the story of emotional is also real. I change only the point of view. I feel almost like I shouldn't admit it, though I'm not sure why. Now, this book is made up of parts of reoccurring sections of the story that Mary just read from, um, pieces from books in her past, um, not her short story collections, but most everything else um, that are appear uh, sometimes in very long sections. They're constantly interrupted either by the story of the devil's treasure or uh, Mary's comments on her own work with thoughts about her own work and what I'm reading from now is her commenting on um, a character from Two Girls that and Thin. Um, I almost feel like I shouldn't admit it that she's real. I'm not sure why, maybe because it makes it seem like I have no imagination. But how can I not write this story? I cannot forget that girl and what happened to her most particularly. I can't forget the obscenity of what her haters chose to call her and why her peers, um, 13 years old, had such contempt for natural emotion as to call someone emotional. It was the worst thing they could think of. It's true, that is beyond my imagination. So I wanna to talk tonight about the whole question of imagination. Um, I remember at the time that Two Girls Fat and Thin came out, you were accused in any number of reviews of just recycling autobiography. I was. I, mean, I recall that. And I was I don't even remember. mystified by that. Well, at one point, um, somebody calls up your father. Um, oh, yeah. 
and says, uh, because the, the fat girl and two girls fat and thin is molested for years by her father until she leaves home. And somebody calls up um, Hi, Daddy. Mary's father and says, he asks if he's upset that the father in the story in the book is a um, savage child molester. Right. I mean, how do you feel like being portrayed as this, you know, this incredibly evil person? And my father asked the reporter, do you know who Edgar Rice Burroughs is? And the reporter answered, um, uh, wasn't he the one who wrote the Tarzan books? Yes, said my father, that's right. Do you think Edgar Rice Burroughs was raised by, raised by apes? And, um, you know, I assume your father really said that. He did. Because, if he, because, if, he didn't, because if he didn't, you're an even better writer than I thought you were. No, um, I couldn't have invented my daddy. But then, you know, there is a, that whole question. I mean, I remember Edmund White once saying, um, I can't remember if he said it to me or if he said it on the radio and I was listening to him. He said, it used to be that when a writer was asked about his work, um, he was asked, you know, how, do you, how did you construct this? Um, what, what was the germ of the idea? Um, what, what problems did you face trying to get the characters onto the page? Do you feel satisfied that you created characters that people are gonna be able to remember? And he says, now all anyone wants to know, and he was particularly talking about Terry Gross on Fresh Air, is, is this true? <laughs> Did this really happen? All a novelist is asked. Uh, what part of this is true? I mean, let's forget about all the other crap, but what really, you know, what really happened to you? And there is um, a scene on in Two Girls, Fat and Thin, where um, the fat girl, again, is, excuse me, Dorothy, is um, at the family dinner table when she's a girl and his fa her father's a very angry man, slowly starting first with veiled attacks on selfish turds and fat slobs, he began to tell me how awful I was. And soon he would be leaning toward me on his elbows, his mouth forming, his words so vehemently that he showed his teeth. You sit there on your fat butt night after night wearing the clothes I bought you, stuffing your face with my food, stupid and ugly, contributing nothing. Tears down ran down my face and over my lips as I ate. After the table was cleared, I went upstairs to lie in bed and I would lie in the dark, sensing my body sprawled out before my head like a country I had seen only on maps. And that's what stopped me, my body like a country I had seen only on maps. And so I wondered, did that, and, and, and to me, you know, that is writing. That is not anybody's biography, even a fantasy biography. That is the magic of words coming onto a page. Um, it obviates any question of, of the real. And so I wonder, how did that sentence come to you? Did it pop into your head? Did you work on it? Was it in fragments and only took shape later, if you remember? I don't, because it was a while ago. But um, I, I, it's a complicated subject. Um, and, and I appreciate your distinction between literal reality and invented reality. And they often have a relationship. But unfortunately, I think that that is a great many people's lives, whether they've been sexually abused or not. I think a lot of people have been uh, hurt to a point that they, their body seems like, and I'm not just, I'm just talking about, again, sex abuse. They, they feel like their body or their self is just like something they've seen on the map. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think that's uh, uh, quite, quite real. But, well, that, that's, you know, just what I was asking is what you're saying is that isn't, analytical statement, whereas to feeling. me it was poetry. 
It's a feeling statement yeah. too that what I wrote, I mean, I don't remember what I was thinking when I wrote it until back in the eighties, but um, but I certainly recognize it now that I knew that. Um, I knew that feeling pretty well. Um, to stay on the same track, much later in the book, when there are sections from the novel, The Mayor, uh, appearing pretty frequently along with interruptions from The Devil's Treasure and commentary on it, um, do you want to briefly describe The Mayor and what it's about? Um, that's something that was taken uh, also uh, a lot of stuff I do borrow pretty freely from life. Um, like, for example, just to digress for a minute, the the woman who you were, whose voice you were speaking in, Dorothy, um, and two girls was not based on me exactly. Oh, she was based on a real person who I met, but I didn't know her well. But a person who had had a quite passionate conversation with, because I interviewed her, I was like twenty something about why she liked Ayn Rand so much. And she quite astonished me by saying, because I was raped by my father for many years, and the young man's own thing gave me hope. And I was just like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. And I said, how? Wow. Wow. How did that give you hope? And she talked to me. And um, she really stayed in my mind. The, the article that I tried to write wasn't very good. But just as a person, she really stayed with me. So in a sense, it, it was based on a real person, but then it was mixed with a lot of other things. So the mayor was kind of the same. Um, the girl in the mayor, the mayor was loosely based on an experience I had when me and my husband hosted some kids uh, in, in our home from through this thing called the Fresh Air Fund, which you probably don't know about because it's not out here. It exists on the East Coast. It's um, a strange organization. I think it still exists, but they they were like 200 years old. And what they do is they bring up city kids. Usually, they're rarely white. They're almost always either black or Latino. Sometimes white kids from Brighton Beach or something, but usually almost all black and Latino kids. And they're brought to almost always white families, upstate New York and in Connecticut, and there's a couple other states that do it. And they're brought there for like two weeks to be in the country. It's called the Fresh Air Fund because they're out in the country breathing fresh air. And it's 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 a weird concept, really, because they are it's treated as if it's the most wonderful thing that ever happened to them. And they're quite young. I mean, the kids that we had, we didn't know anything. I mean, we were so ignorant of just children, really. We got like a six-year-old. Can you imagine a six-year-old taken away from his family and put on a bus to then make a name tag on him and then comes up to a school playground and gets off the bus and the number's called and there's this grinning couple who are white as sheets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> terrifying. I mean, and yet, and yet this is supposed to be the greatest thing that's ever happened. Um, <laughs> it was really, it was really uh, kind of traumatic, I think, for, for him and for, and for us too, but I really liked him. And so we get, we developed a relationship, and a lot of it happened through his sister. She didn't come up to see us at first, but his mother didn't speak English. But he was she was from the Dominican Republic, and um, so we had to communicate through his sister because she could. His mother didn't. I, I translated a letter into Spanish, but his mom actually didn't read. But the sister could read and talk, and we got to know her on the phone, and really liked her. So the next time we didn't go through the pressure fund, we just had them come up and visit us on Easter. And we had this really long relationship and um, she really loved to ride, the real girl. I'm going on too long, but I don't no, know how no, to answer it properly. Um, she really loved to ride. It was one of the few times that she felt really good. She loved, she was just one of these kids that had a great connection with horses. We lived next to a stable and um, it was a small stable and she just really had a nice time over there. She would just go over there sometimes even without or not without lessons, just to muck up the stalls and hang out with the horses and hang out with the women that ran the bar. And um, I loved that and I really had wished that she could do it more. We couldn't offer her that because she didn't come up. She only came up, I don't know, three times a year maybe. We sometimes would go into the city and visit her. Instead of instead of her coming up, um, go see the movie or something. But I, I had it was almost like a fantasy I had in my head, and I was in a time in my life when I really wanted to 
um, write something that wasn't shitty. I wanted to write something where something wonderful happened. And so I thought um, I would write about a girl like her, not exactly like her, but somebody from a city who nobody would expect to win a writing contest, but who would. So that's what I did. Um, it wasn't as I turned, it wasn't as I originally imagined it. Um, I wanted like a Disney ending. I, I think I was going through menopause or something, so I was a little unhinged. Um, and I wanted this Disney ending, but I realized as I explored the issue that could, that was totally not possible, even if she was gifted as a writer, and some people are. Um, there, I mean, believe it or not, some people are naturally gifted with horses. But even if she was that kind of person, she still would not, she would be competing against kids who had access to really quality horses who could take riding lessons every day if they wanted to, who were incredibly competent because we've been told they're, they're great and can do anything. And there's no way she could win a big contest against girls like that. Um, her horse is kind of fucked up too. Um, so I realized she couldn't be what I wanted. So I just had it be quite small hunter jumper, uh, hunter jumper contest uh, in a county level. And that was okay though. I think it could have been enough of a triumph. Anyway, that's the story of the year. But that's what I really want. Your question? Yeah. Um, you write in one of your comments after we've been reading sections from the mayor in this book, there's awkwardness in the mayor, cultural ignorance manifested in details that are just slightly wrong, or even more details that aren't present. In some places, the tone or flavor isn't quite right. I did know the girl, the character is based on well in terms of her deeper being, how she thought and felt, how she interrogated the world, my world in particular. And it goes on like that. And there is questions of, of, of appropriation, taking someone else's story for your own use, your own pleasure, your own gain. And at the end, you said that was she was a heroine to me, a heroine who deserved a story. And that's a, another place in this book that I would just have kind of stopped by that idea of people who deserve a story. You know, it's a cliche that everyone has a, has a story in them. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a novel in them. Uh, but oddly, only a few people actually write them. And this was someone who needed a writer to put her on a page where, you know, regardless of what the rest of the world thinks, she's going to read what you wrote and she's going to have a reaction to it as a young person. Maybe 50 years from now, she'll read that and feel that um, she made a mark on the world. I mean, I just think that's such a powerful uh, sentence. She deserved a story. It, 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 it is, but um, I, the, the, the question is who am I to decide and deserve the story for one thing, but, but, um, but yeah, that, that's an interesting thing though, because I don't know how she will feel about it. She may not be alive 50 years from now. Um, I did give it to her when it came out. I told her I was writing it when I was in the process of writing it. And um, when I published it, I gave it to her and she, I, I said, I don't know if you'll like this. You might think it's boring um, or it just might seem not very real to you. And she opened it while I was there and she read the first few pages and she closed it and she looked at me and she said, it's not boring. <laughs> um, the, the beginning is perhaps a little more exciting than it. But um, anyway, she, I, I asked her later, she took it home and, and sometime later, she didn't say anything to me about it. So I asked her later if she'd read it and she said she'd read some of it, but she didn't want to go any further because she, she, had, she started to have feelings and she stopped. And in a way that was really a big compliment. Um, but on the other hand, I wondered what she meant. Um, what the feelings were. And I didn't know if she was trying to protect me in her own mind by not reading further, that she didn't want to um, 
in her own mind have a bad feeling about the relationship, so she stopped. I'm not sure. And I don't know what she'd feel 50 years from now. I think, I did talk to her about it, but too, at a certain point I said, some, some people might think I was stealing your, your, really, your story or stealing your life in some way, then they'll like to tell you this girl isn't real. And she said, wait, I don't understand what that means, stealing my life, I have my life, you can't steal it unless you kill me or something. And I mean, that's a very commonsensical point of view. Um, and a, a real a reality point of view, but I think. But um, I don't. I, I also think she's kind. She's a very kind person. And regardless of her appeal, I think she, honestly, I think if she read it, she might think it's ridiculous. Frankly, that, that's why she might just be like, "Oh my gosh." Um, but she wouldn't be angry. She'd just feel like, oh, "Mary." Um, but. Um, but because she's a kind person, she would never tell me that. She might feel great about it too. I, I think she would recognize that she was really important to me. She would recognize certain moments in the story of being drawn from life, conversations we had. And she might be like, okay, it's dumb in some ways, but she really, I was important to her because that's, I mean, the girls are the most important thing in my book. There's a, there's a question that comes up throughout the book, this book, which is a question of cruelty. How cruelty manifests itself, how people absorb it, how difficult it can be to expunge. And you, you write at one point about a girl at school I was unclear about how old she was, mocking Martin Luther King. Um, The preface to this is you're talking about how you were raped at 17, it was a violent rape. And you're telling a radio interviewer that you, you know, it was not impossible for you to go on with your life. This is not the worst thing that happened to you. And you compared it to the cruelty that can take place, the cruelty of a rape cruelty that can take place on a school playground. Um, and what happened on the playground in my youth happens every day and nice kids do it. They humiliate, reject, and physically torment other kids to the point that the other kids' humanity becomes distorted and worthless in their only social milieu. The little girl mocking Dr. King wasn't hurting wasn't hurting her peers. Strictly speaking, she wasn't hurting anyone. She was celebrating a general ethos of hurting people. And as young as she was, I don't believe she did not know what she was doing in the moment. And, and you go on. And throughout this book and throughout your work from the beginning, there is, um, to me anyway, there is a facing down of cruelty, of not trimming any edges, uh, of bringing it to life, of making the reader feel uncomfortable is not nearly as strong enough a word, but I'll just use it. And one of the things this book I think is explicitly about is how do we as people um, become better than that, become better than this girl mocking Martin Luther King, because you don't make her foreign, you don't make anyone who is cruel in your work foreign or alien. Um, we can all see ourselves 
in all of your characters. And I just wonder, to me, that was what this book was about. Well, it, it is large, largely, it, that is a big theme in it for sure. And um, yeah, I, I, that was Terry Gross, by the way, um, mm -hmm. and the radio person was when I, she was quite outraged that I, at a, in an essay, it said that being raped was not the worst thing I'd ever experienced. I'd experienced other things that were more painful, including some things that happened on the playground. And to her that she, odd, it didn't ask her to her as a journalist to ask me why, what happened on the playground. Um, but that seems like a bizarre statement, except when you think about it, it's not that much. Because the person who raped me, it was very clear to me that that was wrong. Um, he was not somebody I really knew. Uh, I, I'd seen him on the street before, but I didn't know him. He was attacking me in a brutal physical way that was I mean, there's no question there to me that that was wrong. I mean, sometimes people are raped in situations where they do question themselves and they think maybe they asked for it or maybe they were party to it. That wasn't the case here. Um, I, I was not blaming myself one bit. I knew it was wrong. Whereas the thing that happened with that child, that, that girl who was being saying ugly things about Martin Luther King and by extension, all African Americans, was um, she's a child. She wasn't doing anything physically violent, but there was a real hatred in it that was blended with normalcy. That's what's confusing to me about that kind of cruelty. Um, and, the, and the bullying of that other girl emotional that you talked about, it's normal people, it's nice people. It's people who are, you know, cheerleaders and class presidents. And that's what was horrifying to me when I was little, that, that, that the normalcy combined with the real, and, and that, again, that the girl, making fun of Martin Luther King physically. She was like imitating his face and stuff. Um, it, it, she's a child, but there was a real hatred there that really struck me. And it was almost like hatred that just was looking for a target. Um, and that was really terrifying to me. And, and I had seen that in a lot of different ways by that time in my life. Um, and that was far more disturbing to me. Um, and the girl that was, was referred to as emotional, I mean, my God, what kind of people <coughs> would come up with that? It's the worst thing they could call somebody emotional. And she was attacked physically often. And again, these were just normal kids. And almost everybody took part in it. And yeah, I mean, to me, that that was more disturbing to me than being raped. I mean, it may seem weird, but I, I don't really think it is if you think about it. Um, and so, that, that, that is a question for me, like why is there so much, it's almost like there's cruelty is such a normal part of human life. And if you try to stamp it out one place, it comes out another place. Um, so yeah, that, that's, it's definitely something that, it's just almost like connected with human nature, human vitality in a way. Um, things that people talk about power dynamics now, that, that's what that is, that people are trying to figure out where they can get away with aggression and where it's okay and where it's not. Um, it, it's a very confusing thing. And I also talk about in, in people thinking that my writing is cruel and I'm really attracted to cruelty, specifically Maggie Nelson singled me out as being somebody like that. And um, it, it's more like I'm horrified by it. Um, it's, it's like I, I think people, like I was talking about that with the radio host the other day, Michael Silverblatt, he said that Maggie Nelson is equally fascinated and interested in cruelty because otherwise she wouldn't have written that entire book about cruelty. She's obviously fascinated by it. And I don't think it's, I, I think she's the same as me. It's like you look at this thing and you go, what is this? Why, why does, who are we? Why does this happen? Why is this part of our nature? Why is this part of every human society? Why do people victimize other people like this? And um, yeah, it's an unanswerable question. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that is going through the book. So I wonder if people have questions for Mary about this book, about any of her work. Uh, hope so. Only takes one to start it off. I often try to plant somebody, but I didn't do that today. 
Yeah. Um, how would you uh, how would you fit Veronica in with the other um, work we've been talking about and the things we've been talking about? Oh well, um, it very much the question is how would Veronica fit in with that theme. It's very much about the theme of not necessarily overt cruelty, but the cruelty of how this is what there's a section. I don't know, I probably can't find it, otherwise, I'd read it because I put it better than I'm doing right now. But um, this, this questioning of what cruelty is and why it's so much a part of our nature and why it seems to be part of creativity almost and generative force, like deciding this is beauty. Like Veronica is all about, it's a part of the one of the characters is a model in the fashion industry. And the fashion industry has been described as cruel by, by many people. Um, and, and it is in a sense, it's like it's like trying to nail down human life force and and translate it into like beauty, useful beauty. And this is it, and this is what you're supposed to be. And we're gonna trap it right here on the page and don't move. And there it's not deliberate cruelty, but it's a kind of it, it is cutting out a whole lot of stuff if you don't fit into this one place or do you, people look what happened to you know people frantically trying to make their bodies right and frantically trying to look a certain way and um I, I think it has to do with with it there um at one point I use a phrase um it, it's not just about beauty it's about trying to make life perfect in a certain way um America is especially fixated on that I think perhaps more other countries have realize that you can't be part of the But but yeah, that, that fixation on like I think I use a phrase in the book at some point, the food in the store looked like it was so perfect it almost looked like it was trying to be something other than food. Um and it, there's a cruelty to that in my mind because it cuts out so much. And there's so much like softness and just humanity that just doesn't doesn't fit in that box and you have to cut off the limbs in order to make it fit. So I, I, and also what, what's happened, um, this is making a big jump perhaps, but what's happened, what's happening in terms of the ruination of the planet that's been happened almost in pursuit of this sort of kind of perfect world of perfect comfort where everything can be burned and destroyed in order to have a, a perfect home and be up to a certain level. And so, yeah, I, I think it, it very much fits in with those things just in a, a sounds like a more abstract way, but, but it, it isn't particularly. I guess I was just thinking because there's just it felt like when I, I read it a while ago, so I don't remember very well, but it just felt like there's a lot of kindness that happens yes. in the book too. So that's that's kind of what I was thinking. Well, oh yeah, I mean, I don't mean I just write about cruelty. I mean, there's no, there's, there's this humans. I don't, there's a balance. I mean, people in response to cruelty or suffering always, almost always try. There's always somebody who will try to be kind or is kind. But there's always that opposition. I write very much about oppositions and that that's definitely um the, the characters in Veronica are struggling with that. Um the, like the impulse to like hold yourself in a certain way, not just the model, but also the character of Veronica has tried to make herself a certain kind of person who's always got the right answer, who's always sharp, who's always got her face fixed in a certain way and is present has a presentation. Um, that isn't exactly cruelty, but it's there's something in human that it, that's like a type of inhumanity that we're all attracted to in some way. It's like a masking. And that's very much the theme of that book is, is a kind of masking. And I was in that book, especially looking at the relationship between masking and the lives and underneath the mask, and how sometimes both one reveals the other. Does that make sense? Yeah, in the back. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, there was another hand. Yeah. Um, so, Mary, I'm wondering if you could, when you, you talk about, you're talking about themes and meanings and such things you're exploring in the work, but I'm wondering how conscious you are of what it is you're exploring. Like, because I also would imagine you begin with characters, you begin with ideal, you begin with writing, or in different things. So, how, um, when does and a lot of I imagine the process of this book is looking back at a bunch of different things and seeing which which themes you know have been constant in the work. How you know in, in terms of the original process of, of creating these stories and books, how conscious are you of what themes you're going to explore and, and how and what 
the point surface in terms of more traditional um, the question is about how conscious I am of things um, when I'm actually writing, um, as opposed to this book. Um, I'm not. I'm not that much most of the time. I think most writers are not fully. They may have some certain things in mind, but there's always things that come out that are surprising or that you plan on. Um, this book, this particular book, when I looked back, I could more see um, sort of through lines and themes. Um, Veronica, I was more conscious of it than most um, most things I've written, um, but I, I think it's a kind of mixture of consciousness and unconsciousness when you're writing something like that. Um, there's kind of both the unconscious mind and the more you know top level mind working in tandem, hopefully. Right. Do we have? Another. I had another question. Go ahead. Um, I know from talking to you that you were you enjoyed watching Game of Thrones, <laughs> and, um, and and part of the appeal, cruelty weighs into it. I mean, there's there's not cruelty, the joy of it, but the, the joy of combating it you know, and beating it in some sort. I mean, there is something, and in our politics, certainly cruelty is an enormous animating force. For one side, and then to put the, the side to defeat cruelty. I mean, it's, I, I don't know if you could properly go over it. But... I don't know if I can address the Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true, I got very involved in Game of Thrones during the pandemic. I didn't see it when it came out. <laughs> um, and I didn't find it entirely unrealistic. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely a story about power and cruelty for sure, and, and about you know, how people cope with it. Thing I found interesting about Game of Thrones is that um, I, I felt because I, I wondered why am I so interested in this particular story, and I, I think and why are so many people? And I think I thought it was because it's about parental love or the lack of it. Because the most interesting characters, it, oh, the males particularly, this didn't really apply to female characters that much, but it seemed like the most interesting male characters, both the good ones and the bad ones, are people who've been brutally rejected by the by their father. And the ones that wound up being the best were uh, Tyrion and Jon Snow, and particularly Tyrion um, was rejected horribly. The father didn't want him at all. He's a dwarf. Um, and he nonetheless maintains his goodness and humanity. And he, even though he's almost derailed repeatedly. And then Jon Snow also isn't treated as badly, but is basically sent off to the icy fastness uh, as a bastard and not. Not he can't even have sex, you just start to go to the icy fastness and fend off evil. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he nonetheless also suffers, you can see it, but he, he maintains his goodness for the really bad characters. I hope this isn't totally boring for those of you who never saw Game of Thrones or, or despised it. But Ramsey Snow, also brutal father, and just totally gives into evil, just becomes a monster, a torturer. And then the most interesting character of all, Theon. I was so involved in Theon. For those of you who haven't seen it, Theon was like, he goes from being a really beautiful, arrogant young guy. Well, I don't think he was that bad, really, but supposed to be a horrible, despicable person. And then he gets, Ramsey gets a hold of him and tortures him and castrates him and just, anyway, it's, a, it's an ugly thing. But, but he, he, like, Theon is someone who's been rejected brutally by his father, but been exposed to familial love because of being adopted by the, um, what were they, the Starks. And so he's, he's kind of torn between both, both forces and he goes to the dark side trying to please his wicked father and it becomes a really horrible person and murders children, tries to murders children and does everything wrong. But when he's totally battered and tormented, I, 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 I could stop, but, but what my point is, he, he's, it's almost a tension that everybody goes through, but how you can be broken by being hurt. I mean, I, that's something I feel like I've learned um, really a lot in the last few years that a lot of people who are evil are, have been, be, not everybody, I'm not trying to make excuses for real evil, but people, a lot of times people can become really bad because they've been really hurt. And it's, it, it, it's I think that was part of why that, that TV show had such an effect on so many people because that, especially the lack of familial love uh, working people or not. Um, you know, that's what I thought about. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, please. Uh, 
Mary, would you feel comfortable talking about your process a little bit? Maybe less so with this book, but more. I'm a huge fan of interpretive questions. Uh, and I guess I'm just curious about how you go from like ideas to, to a story or a novel. Are you like a very disciplined dynamic? Or... Um, no. Uh, this the question was about process and if I was a disciplined writer. I, I actually, it's not true. Sometimes I am. Um, I can be. Once I focus on something, I can be very disciplined about it. My difficulty is just I'm, I'm not very focused by nature. Mm -hmm. And I can be all over the place. And then I don't have much of a process. Um, it's just constantly trying to get myself to sit down and look at it. Um, but once I once I get focused, I, I can be quite disciplined. I, I, I for me it works best to start um, working fairly early in the day. At least look at it at like after I eat breakfast or something. Work, pay attention to it for either working on it or thinking about it for two hours. Then take a break for maybe an hour or two, and then come back for another two hours. When I work really well, I will work for four hours at a time. Um, the longest I've ever done straight is six hours, but that's unusual. It usually is either in two hour or four hour increments. And I find that that can work really well. Two hours and like take a break for an hour, another two hours, go out and do errands, come back and maybe do four hours. Um, if you can think of it that way, I'm just gonna sit here for two hours and sometimes it will go over, um, but just commit yourself to two hours where you're sitting there um, focusing. That, that, that's kind of, there's a hand in the back. Yep. I'd like to know some of your early uh, writing influences. Early writing influences. Um, I can answer the question, or I can try, but I'm, I'm curious as to why, why, why does that make you curious? I mean, this is a sincere question. I'm not trying to turn, put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> It's hard, <laughs> it is. Um, I think it's taken a lot of practice for me to answer questions recently. But um, I, I think influence is very hard to define um, because I think people often, when they're asked what their influences are, they just rattle off the you know the artists they the writers they admire the most and they hope have influenced them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's kind of unpredictable, really. Like. I probably have been influenced by Vladimir and the book of simply because I write quite a lot. Um, I think you're influenced more strongly by people you read earlier. And I'm also sure I've been influenced by people who I actually don't think are very good just because I was exposed to them at a young age and they struck me emotionally with a certain, once some snotty person a long time ago at a meeting said, were you influenced by Eric and John? Thank you, you were. And I actually, <laughs> I actually took it seriously. I said, yeah, you're probably right. Because I read her when I was like 17 and I'm sure it had some kind of back brain influence. Um, I think you're influenced by music. I think you're influenced by TV shows. I think you're influenced by things you look at online these days. Um, so it, it's not just things that you read that you wish you could emulate or that you admire. Um, but I, Flannery O'Connor, I would say, was quite a strong influence. Not that I write like her, but I, she definitely I think had some uh, effect on me because I read her young and, and really identified with the, the world that she described or recognized it quite deeply. Um, Colette probably had some influence on me early on. Um, John Updike, I mean, you're not supposed to like him, but I, I really like the way he was language. Um, some of his early books. Um, that's, that's kind of all I can think of right now, but I think probably things that influenced me a lot I'm not even aware of. Do we have another? Well, I'll ask you one, Steve. It's written very beautifully, it seems to me, about one writer, often cited by the writers of the A lovely, I guess it was kind of homage to Chekhov, and in particular about uh, that remarkable passage in the short story, Goose Barracks. Um, could you might speak about? That feeling that you described in that incredible paragraph about the weight of the world. It's the simultaneity of everything that goes on. That people were actually allowed to let the world flood in in that way of what the result would be. 
Yeah, you know, you're talking about you're, something I wrote about Chekhov. Um, it was a passage, a famous passage in Kusperi's called about the man with the little hammer. And one of the characters, what I love about Chekhov is it's, it's such a combination of comedy and pathos. And the characters are ridiculous on one hand and they're often futile. Um, but this society he describes, pre-revolutionary Russia, really reminds me of America right now. So on one hand, you've got this very, you know, high degree of sophistication and sensitivity and concern, and then um, just real like raw brutality and deprivation on the other. And um, so yeah, he was talking about that uh, that this liberal person is talking to his house guests about how you know what's going on in the provinces. So many gallons of vodka drunk, so many children dead, so many women battered, so many you know he lists all the murders and things that are going on, and nobody pays attention, people continue going to the market and their idle concerns. And it, it's in a way a pathetic, ridiculous speech because you can see he's not a person who's playing. In fact, he's saying, I can't do anything about this, but maybe you can. Um, and it's in a way a very different time because people who live that in that time, if they had money or if they were in the middle class, really weren't going to be looking at the things that Chekhov was describing, which he saw because he was a doctor and went to work in very impoverished um, provinces. And um, but what struck me about it and why I wanted to why I wrote something about it is I think it's still true that even though we can see because we have television, we have cell phones, we have we know what's happening. I wrote it during a time when Hurricane Katrina had, had just happened and people were, you know, trapped on their roofs or uh, just super uh, the superdome, like with no food and hot and ill, and everybody was watching it. And yet at the same time, even though we can literally see it, there's still somehow that kind of psychic separation. If it's not happening to you, you don't quite believe it's happening. Um, so I, I think that that still exists. So yeah, that's why I wrote that. Well, thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm really privileged to have been here. I, I think Mary will be signing books. I'm not sure where, hope so. But thanks, thanks for coming.